squat, 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 squat. The week before England play Wales is normally about the noisiest in rugby as England players line up to scream how much better potato soup is without the leak and the Welsh fire pot shots off for James Bond, the Queen, uh, Kira Knightley as either coach put their holiday home in the opposite country on Zoopla and the media laps it all up like Tyke Furlong with that leakless soup. And yet, the lead into this year's game at Twickenham had none of that. There was a two week build up, and yet neither coach denounced the other nation as a tourist destination. None of the England players called Shirley Bassey overrated or said Twin Town isn't that funny. None of the Welsh players pissed on a Henry Hoover or spat a fish and chips. We didn't even get to see Nick Tompkins publicly renounce his birthland by doing a great big shit on a St George's flag. Instead, this year they saved it all up for a game that had virtually everything you could want from an England Wales encounter. 60 plus points, an all time a try to be discussed with a misty eye across the valleys for decades to come, aggro a plenty, constant scraps, a red card, a coach lashing out at the referee. Absolute rubbish. At the end, we're 13 against 16, it's hard. And loads of, you know, actual rugby to discuss beyond the boorish, laddish bollock grabbing that I spent my weekend talking about on Twitter. So, let's look at that rugby and delve into how England struck back from last year's downing in Cardiff to claim the Triple Crown and reignite their title chase. The game eventually finished 33-30, which both was and wasn't a fair reflection of the game. Wales were good enough to deserve a losing bonus point, and yet it also felt somehow flattering, as England did that thing they do once again, a hugely aggressive showing that wins them the game in the first 50 odd minutes. Despite some very promising passages of attack and some smart kicking from Wales, England continued to do angry wonders without the ball, and when it mattered most dismembered the defence alarmingly easily. This began just three minutes in as Anthony Watson and his hair like melty chocolate fingers crossed for the game's first try. The precursor to this came from a really smart beat from Watson himself who, as he's being hauled into touch, just deliberately drops the ball on Justin Tipperick's boot so that it comes off him and gives England the line out. From here, it becomes smart work from Eddie Jones and the coaches rather than any individual player. Under Wayne Pivak and new forwards coach Jonathan Humphreys, Wales have defended most mauls in 22 likes. So, most of all commit but the ever hard-working and dynamic Ken Owens steps just out with Dylan Lewis waiting by the side to watch for the peel. They're just there to stop a breakaway to have two heavy units ready to kill any momentum splitting off from the main mall. However this also leaves Wales with two front rowers covering what can easily become a 10 meter channel and thus it presents an opportunity for some eddy antics. So England set them all quickly. The entire Welsh pack bar Owens and Lewis commit and the moment they're all snapped on, Curry peels off. The maul was just a bluff to commit the forwards. They were never interested in doing it. Youngs starts 10 metres back. There's no way Wales are watching him that closely. It's a fairly standard position for a nine to be in. Yet he's also, even now, serving a second role, standing directly in front of the eventual try scorer like a human shield because virtually everything about this move is about hiding Anthony Watson from Welsh eyes until it's too late. Curry plays the ball into Youngs, at which point, God, who'd be a Welsh defender? Tuolangi is running a hard line in midfield, with Ford and Farrell floating round at the back to distribute, to play off, fixing the Welsh backs and meaning they can't afford to drift. However, the really tricksy work is going on in the channel where Wales left just Owens and Lewis and where Anthony Watson is about to time his run. Tom Curry and Jamie George, the headband twins here, run dummy lines exactly either side of where the pass is about to be threaded. Navidi rejungs his body language early and notices the ball is going to go back inside, but he points for everyone to watch George because the move has worked. None of the Welsh defence have noticed that Watson is there. England then do something incredibly clever and wear a kit the same colour as the touchline, meaning Ben Young's pass goes to hand. England have dragged Wales' two slowest players out, given them three men to watch, then pass to a fourth man they didn't even know was there and is possibly the quickest on the English team. And from here, it's all down to Thomas Williams, who, as we know, has a slightly shaky record when it comes to a few metres out from his own try line. Williams was watching the ball and drifting across and has to adjust and come back in on himself which makes it pretty hard to hold your balance and make the tackle. Liam Williams gets to him but Watson is a fantastic finisher and can stretch out and score. It's a lovely try and a product of Eddie doing his homework and his team putting in a great number of rehearsals most likely to get the timing right between Youngs, Watson and the runners hanging around either side. However, having just been opened up like this, Wales identify the problem right away and they plug the hole. 
the next time England have a line out in the 22, Wales move Josh Navidi in from midfield to the space where in past they were using Owens and Lewis. However, whilst this is a smart way for them to solve the problem, it does leave Wales defending in a pattern different to the one they've trained with all week. And it allows Benjamin Ryder Youngs, yes that's his middle name, to make a wee little snipey snipe snipe. A snipe. England then worked to further dismantle and disorganise its defence through being able to generate several phases of quick ball in a row. Now, under Warren Gatland and Sean Edwards, Wales had a very particular breakdown strategy that involved basically throwing someone, just anyone, at virtually every ruck to just slow the opposition possession down a second, a half second, sometimes even less than that, but it makes a huge difference in a game in terms of realigning your defence. But they always left the key breakdown operators, most often Sam Warburton and Justin Tipperick, to only enter rucks when a turnover could be won, putting a different, more expendable player into the other breakdowns. Under Wayne Peebach, my best friend, I'm so proud, I'm so proud of him, Sam Warburton, has been appointed the team's breakdown coach, and he seems to be doing his job really well, because now the entire team defends rucks like Sam Warburton, except not quite in the way you'd hope from that sentence. Peebach's Wales almost never enter a ruck they can't win. And hence, when they do enter, we see either backs like Nick Tompkins here against Italy, or on Saturday, George North winning turnovers. This is all about conserving your resources and picking your moments, but it does mean you run the risk of giving the opposition incredibly quick ball. And here, because they're not working to slow it, because there's no chance of them turning it over, it allows England to generate enormous momentum. This keeps Wales scrambling until Farrell is happy to call the ball out to the backs. Laws and Curry run lovely lines to hold Ken Owens and slightly baffle Tipperick, stopping the pair being able to drift across quickly enough, meaning Baby Faz only has to worry about the backs. As Farrell takes the ball, he knows his primary job is to fix clubmate Tompkins, but whilst he's doing that, he's also looking wider. In real time, he throws this pass pretty rapidly, but in international rugby terms, in the alternate timeline of a world-class fly half, he waits almost as long to throw this pass as he has waited to hear his dad say I love you. England have stacked this touchline with four ball players. Slade and Ford are both running into North's channel, and Farrell just waits until North decides which one he wants to hit more. The problem isn't the decision North makes but the fact that he makes one. The slightest change in body language and Farrell knows where to throw the pass. That pass goes to George Ford. Now, not many teams slot their 10 into the 13 position like this, but having Ford as the wide-ish man just means England have their best passer giving the most difficult pass. George Ford is on pretty sen genuinely sensational form at the minute and was also key in England's other try, their third try, threading this ball beautifully to Manu Tuolangi. England's scores were extremely typical of this team. One from an extremely eddy set move and the other two from contorting a defence through pace and power then relying on Ford and Farrell to slot in and make the right decisions at the right times. England's 10-12 axis has traditionally been talked about as being about the skills of those players but it's really about their ability to read rugby their ability to come in and make decisions when they need to be made. Having these two and Elliot Daly in this side gives England three excellent decision makers and ball players able to identify and make the most of space. And this is an idea Wales are currently working towards, and we saw the first flashes of where they're going on Saturday. The Welsh space setup is what fancy rugby people call a 1 3 2 2 played off 10. And whilst I intend to still make a video after the championship describing exactly what that is and going into blah 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 blah, I'm just going to cover the important bits for what I'm going to talk about right now. Basically, Wales position several groups of forwards around the field and then off at ruck play a flat pass to Dan Bigger, the fly half, who selects the runner in the most space from one of those groups to carry the ball. There's more nuance to this and I went into it a bit in my video on the Wales France game, but when it's effective and quick and Bigger is selecting the right runners, most importantly, it can get Wales going forward in an almost unstoppable manner, building momentum on momentum each phase on phase. However, in the first three games, we've only seen Dan Bigger doing this. He's the only man that's slotted in. Other players may have come in as first receiver, but they weren't used to execute the structure and plan, the core of the game. Now, Wayne Bivak Scarlet's team played a similar structure, but they used to do something really smart in also using the winger or fullback, most often Steph Evans or Johnny McNichol, in the role Dan Bigger has been playing, allowing the fly half to operate in the grandmaster, wait for the right moment manner that Ford and Farrell do for England. This is where I would imagine Wales are headed. On Saturday, a few times we saw other players slot into Bigger's role, such as right here, Thomas Williams with Navidi coming in at nine, or Nick Tompkins here. However, as you can see from this example, Tompkins, who had a generally excellent game, doesn't select the runner in the most space. This game marked step two in PFAC getting Wales 
both playing the exact structure he wants, but it isn't quite there yet. This will come with time. It's about players getting used to making these decisions. And I'd imagine we'll be seeing McNichol or possibly Tomkins, maybe even Jonathan Davis when he's back, coming in and slotting into players' role later in the year and Wales' attack continuing to evolve. There is maybe something slightly concerning about the fact this game plan hasn't quite clicked after six weeks together, but if his plan is to build for a World Cup, there's loads of, there's loads of time. This is game four out of about 40. And it's not like Wales weren't coherent on Saturday, scoring this absolute blinder straight from the second half kickoff. There's not much to talk about from a Welsh perspective on this try, it's just glorious handling and timing and support work. It's the kind of try that makes you wish they still made the 101 Great Welsh Try DVDs I'd get for Christmas every year, because this beauty would not be out of place in and amongst the work of Gerald Davies and Gareth Edwards. But from an England perspective, it's a rare case of Eddie's extra work backfiring. As I've talked about to death at this point, what England won more than anything from a kickoff is a line out against the All Blacks, against Ireland, in virtually any game where England have gone on to dominate. They've kicked off, the opposition has cleared into touch, and England have then had a launch pad from which to attack, and they've run some play that Eddie Jones designed to catch out the opposition, and they've often scored right from it. However, last year, Wales were virtually the only team to figure this out, to know that England wanted the line out, so they kicked in field. England anticipated them doing this again, and hence left six men in the backfield to cover. Contrast their chase on this kickoff to in the same situation against Ireland in the last game. England send 13 up to small for the Irish because they correctly anticipate they'll kick the ball into touch. They only send nine up to hit Wales, with a lot of them over on the other side anyway, because they think they'll kick the ball in field, and hence England want lots of options to counter-attack. This means all Tompkins has to do is avoid the onrushing curry, and then he can just draw Cruz and put Navidi away down the wing. The spirit of 73 then takes over, and soon enough there's some glorious passing in Justin Tipperick. He's storming away under the post to score the first of his two tries. It's excellent by Wales, but an example of Eddie Jones thinking about the cart before even stopping to consider that he only has a big dog to pull it. That old school spirit may come in handy next week as Wales face Scotland. So often the side on the other end of those all-time pearlers on those great DVDs I used to watch. England, meanwhile, are in for an even less noisy week than this one, as they prepare to sit twiddling their thumbs, waiting to resume their title chase in, likely, October. Cheers, coronavirus. Hey gang, it's me again. I had a proper good ending for that, but it got cancelled because of the coronavirus. So what are you going to do? I'm sorry about that. Um, that is the next game covered in the Six Nations. I'm going to move on to Scotland v France next. That is coming up. In the meantime, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who supports the channel on Patreon um, and to the Final Player app, who I've mentioned in the past, and to everyone else that's made it possible for me to get for as many of the games as I have. Uh, I have an extra bit of content um, from the game between the England women and the Wales women from the weekend as well. I'm going to get up hopefully next week uh, once I've covered the, the remaining games. Obviously, there's only one game on this weekend, unfortunately, at this point. Um, but I'm still working. My plan was to cover every game in the Six Nations. I'm going to do that, even if not all the games are going to be played. So that's the plan. I am not going to make a video on Ireland v England, and Sergio Parisi is very angry about that. But otherwise, um, thank you very much, and I'll see you hopefully very soon, hopefully in the next couple of days, for the video on England against That Was Unsafe. Uh, who did they play? England play, I've just mentioned them. France, Scot Fr Scotland beat France. There we are. Cheers. See you when I look at that. Bye. You're playing some of the best rugby of your life at the moment.